We live in an imperfect world. As long as there are people, it's going to be imperfect. As the Buddha said, if you gave everyone the amount of gold that we would have in two ranges of the Himalayas, in other words, think of the Himalayas being entirely gold. Okay, two times that. You gave that much to each person. It still wouldn't be enough for that person's desires. I remember in Thailand there was a time when a very wealthy millionaire was running for prime minister, and people figured, well, he's wealthy already, he's probably not going to be corrupt. And it turned out that his thirst for wealth was more than anyone else could imagine. As you get wealthier, you start thinking about more and more and more. There's never enough. And you have a world full of people who have no enough. And it's going to be conflict. So if you're going to look for perfection, you can't look outside. You've got to look inside. Of course, we start out with very imperfect minds. But the Buddha himself started out imperfect. He started out with greed, aversion, and delusion, just like ours. But he was able to find qualities in his mind that he could develop. Resolution, ardency, heedfulness. That allowed him to get past those defilements. Now, we have those qualities in ourselves, to some extent. Heedfulness is when you see the dangers that can come when you act in unskillful ways. But you realize that if you avoid those unskillful ways of acting, you can avoid the dangers. If you know, there are just, just dangers all around that we couldn't prevent, then heedfulness would be of not much use. But it's because we can avoid those dangers through our actions that we should be heedful. Ardency is trying our best. In the context of mindfulness practice, it's one of the three qualities the Buddha said that you bring to mindfulness. There's mindfulness itself, the ability to keep something in mind, as we're doing with the breath right now, keeping the breath in mind, and keeping in mind all the tricks we've learned about how to deal with the breath. You don't have to run them through your mind all the time, but have them at your fingertips. So. It when you recognize a certain problem is coming up with the breath, or problem coming up with the mind trying to stay with the breath, you can remember, you've dealt with this problem before. How did you deal with it then? Give that a try. And then you're alert, watching to see what's actually going on, particularly what's actually happening in your actions and the results of your actions. It's not a generalized awareness of the present moment. It's more specific. What are you doing? what's coming about as a result. And then ardency is the discernment factor here. Realizing that after all your actions will make a difference, so do your best to act in ways that are really skillful. That's wise. So those are qualities the Buddha developed as well. Then there's resolution. When you make up your mind, you're going to stick with something and see it through. This, the Buddha said, was the secret to his awakening, or one of the two secrets to his awakening. But as long as he hadn't found true awakening, he was not going to give up in his efforts. Now, to be resolute like that, you have to have inner resources to draw on. A lot of it has to do with your perception of what resources you have. There was that time when John Fung announced out of nowhere that we were going to be sitting up all night, one night, and we'd been working pretty hard that day. And so I mentioned to, to him, I said, I don't think I'll be able to do that. He looked at me and he says, well, is it going to kill you? Well, no. He said, then you can do it. And so I was able to do it. And I found resources inside that enabled me to stick with it when, that I hadn't suspected. This is what happens when you push yourself a little bit more than you would, would feel comfortable with. 
You stick with it, stick with it, stick with it, and you're going to find something in there, a resource that you didn't realize you had. So learn to perceive the fact that you have more inside of you than you think. You can think of those images the Buddha gives for patience and goodwill. Your goodwill is as large as the earth. Someone comes along with a little basket and a hoe, and he tries to make the earth be without earth, and he digs here and there, and he spits here and there, and he urinates here and there, and he says, be without earth, be without earth. And he's comical, because the earth is so much bigger. Now, you wouldn't have that perception of your goodwill. People can come and do things to you, and don't see them as big and horrible and overwhelming you, and that you're a little tiny victim. Imagine yourself as the earth, and there's just that man with his basket and his hoe. And it's amazing how much having that perception in mind allows you to find the resources that would correspond to that, that yes, you can take this, yes, you can stick with this. So think of your goodwill as being like the river Ganges. Someone comes with a torch to try to burn up the river, and of course the river can't be burned up. It's water. People can come and try to make you angry, but you try to make your mind like water. They can insult you, but in that case, think of the quality of your goodwill as being like space. People can try to write words in space, but there's no place for it to stick. Some people say things to you with the intention of harming you or hurting you. Don't let them stick. In the words just fall away. When you think in these ways, this is using metal fabrication to shape your experience right here, right now. You find that you have resources inside that you hadn't imagined before. That's what allows your resolution to grow. The other quality the Buddha said was important for his awakening was not being content with skillful qualities. It sounds strange. Of course, it means you would definitely not be content with unskillful qualities. The images in the canon are always of trying to get rid of them like a man who has his head on fire. You would be resolute, mindful. To put that fire out, focused on putting the fire out. In the same way, when passion, aversion, delusion come into the mind, when any unskillful quality comes into the mind, you've got to figure out, how do I get past this? You can't just sit there and wallow in it and enjoy it. You realize, okay, this is going to burn me up. This is going to cause problems. I'm going to put out the fire. And that's unskillful qualities. Skillful qualities, the Buddha said, okay, he would not risk content. What he meant was he was looking for the ultimate skill. The skill of the Noble Eightfold Path that would lead to the deathless. And anything that wasn't up to that standard, he would not rest content. So that's how the Buddha came to awakening. And the message of his awakening, of course, is that we can all do this too. After all, he was a human being starting out imperfect. But he was able to find the qualities inside that led to the perfection of awakening. And they're all human qualities. There's a passage in Richard Feynman where he talks about how when he'd gone down to teach in Brazil, he learned the bongo drums. And someone had written to him one time and said, I really like learning the fact that you learn the bongo drums, it makes you human. And Feynman was really upset. Here he was, a great physicist, and somehow being a physicist was not part of being human. So I wrote a blistering letter back to the person, and being a physicist is just as human as playing the bongo drums. In the same way, being a Buddha is just as human as 
being whoever you are. Just that it's extraordinary. Our problem, of course, is that we want the world to be perfect, but we want to be let off the hook. We don't want to have to be held to a standard where we're perfect. It's only natural that we get angry at things we don't like. It's only natural that we have lust and greed for things that we want. Well, listen to that phrase, only natural. That's all it is. We tend to use only natural as an excuse. But it's more of a put-down when you really think about it. What the Buddha did was very human, but it was more than natural. The natural way is just to get born, and as he said in his memories of previous lifetimes, have a certain appearance, have certain food, have certain experience of pleasure and pain, and then you die. And then you come back for more. And you come back for more. It's like that penguin in the story of Charcot's trips down to the Antarctic. They're setting up camp near a penguin colony, and the plan was to use the penguin co colony as a source of food. Of course, the penguins didn't know this. They were curious. They came to look at the sailors as they were setting up camp. And one of the penguins got very close, and so one of the sailors took off his glove and put it on the penguin's head. And the penguin went running around, running around, running around, trying to shake the glove off its head. And they finally got it off its head, and then it came back for more. This time they put a sailor's hat on him, and he went running around, running around with the sailor's hat, trying to shake it off, finally shook it off, kept coming back for more, not realizing that their, their ultimate plan was to eat it. All the penguin could see was the fun, and that's us. All we can keep in mind is the fun. We tend to forget all the suffering. Or if we see the suffering, we say, well, that's part of life. You have to put up with it. But the Buddha was saying, no, you don't have to put up with that. There's something better. I know there are people who don't like being held to this standard. They'd rather be told, well, there's nothing to do. Just accept what you've got. Be perfectly fine with that. That's the best you can do. That's really defeatist. The Buddha was not a defeatist. He was a victor. As he said, the Eightfold Noble Eightfold Path is the path to victory. So here he is establishing a standard for us that this can be done. So even though the world isn't perfect, it is possible to find perfection inside. And in the course of finding it inside, it's not like you're abandoning the world. Because a part of developing perfection, of course, one of the major perfections is the perfection of generosity. There's the perfection of virtue. These are the perfections with which you help the world as you're helping yourself. With renunciation. The Buddha is basically not talking it's simply about doing without. It means looking for your pleasures in places besides sensuality. That includes right mindfulness, right concentration. And as he notes, as you develop the mind in those directions, you're helping the people around you. So the path is not a selfish path. Simply it's focused. You realize that what you can do for the world the success with which you try to help the world depends on a lot of things besides your intention, besides your actions. And when there's a war, there's a real limitation on how far the goodness you do can go. When there's famine, when there's p pandemics, I mean, there's lots of things that happen to the human race that put limitations on how long things will last and how long our impact on the human race will last. But that doesn't defeat us. We still do our best. And in doing our best, we leave behind traces. Think of the Buddha. 2,600 years ago. Tomorrow will be the 
anniversary of his cremation. How many other people do we remember the date of their cremation, the date of their burial? There are very few. Remember, because he's left behind this excellent example, and it's one full of hope. He was able to take his human nature and develop to the perfection of awakening. And we've got that potential within us as well. So don't see that as one more burden being placed on you, one more impossible measuring stick against which you're supposed to measure yourself. Think of it as opening to total satisfaction. Remember those two Himalayan ranges of gold would never satisfy you. But nirvana is more than satisfying. That's what the Buddha and all the great arahants have said. And it's up to us to be interested in what they say or not, to be tantalized by what they say or not. But only a fool would not be interested. 